Our next task is to make sure that our regression relationship isn't being unduly influenced by a single point or a few points. Now collectively, uh, these procedures fall under the idea of influence and outlier detection. Now outlier detection is something that one would probably want to undertake uh, before even fitting a regression uh, because one would want to detect these points and either eliminate them or deal with them before even fitting a regression. Now influence, which is a related sort of idea, uh, really takes place after a regression is fitted. Uh, so we're going to cover these topics sort of together right now, uh, but notice that one can undertake these um, really at different times. Now to start, uh, we need to distinguish between the idea of an outlier uh, that is with respect to a model or with respect to simply the predictors. Um, now we can think of outliers really as points that don't belong because we think either the process that's generating most of our data doesn't apply to them, uh, or an outlier that simply is just extreme um, because that person is just simply extreme. Now when we exclude data, we really have to make sure that we're not doing so to capitalize on chance or to uh, make certain things statistically significant uh, because we simply want to uphold our theories. Uh, so with all of these techniques, we really need to make sure that we are not doing them uh, in the interest of our own theories, uh, but only in the interest of preserving our data sets to have only pure and uh, valid data for our particular situation. Now the simplest way, especially in the multiple regression sense, or in the sense where we have multiple predictors, uh, the easiest way to get a quick view of really the uh, scope of the data and of all the points in it is to use the analyze, modeling, or sorry, multivariate, uh, multivariate section. And what this will do is allow us to visualize all at once the relationships among our data uh, and also the uh, distance of the points to the centroid, that is the multivariate distance of every point to the middle of the distribution in multivariate space. Uh, so what we're going to do here is we're going to take our predictors, uh, age, severity, anxiety, and put them in the Y columns here. And notice that I haven't included satisfaction, uh, because what I'm considering now, or what I'm concerned with now, is really how far an individual is um, from their location to the centroid uh, formed by these three variables, that is our predictor space. Uh, so go ahead and hit OK and you'll see what we get. Now the first thing we're going to get is the bivariate fits uh, of each of our variables against every other variable. So age against severity, age against anxiety, and severity against anxiety. Uh, now right away you might be able to pick out a few points that look extreme uh, but of course there is going to be points that fall outside of these uh, density ellipses. Uh, these are just the 95% density ellipses. Um, but this isn't really giving us an indication that those points are necessarily too extreme to be considered valid. Uh, and of course in this uh, particular plot there really don't appear to be any points that are unduly far away from the center of these uh, bivariate fits. Uh, but what we can do with this platform is request uh, several different distance measures that actually take into account the uh, location of the points relative to the centroid. So if we go to the drop down and we go to outlier analysis, you see we can request a couple things. Uh, the Mahalanobis distances, uh, jackknife distances, which is a metric of the Mahalanobis distance but with that point removed when calculating the centroid, and this t-squared, which is another way of uh, visualizing the Mahalanobis distance uh, simply by squaring it. Let's uh, request the Mahalanobis distance and also go back and request the jackknife uh, and we'll step through these together. And let's scroll down. Now what you'll see with, uh, within these two plots uh, is every point in your data set plotted by row, so across the range uh, to all of our 46 data points here. And what you'll see is uh, across this, this distance metric how far each of those points are to the multivariate mean, that is to the centroid. Uh, and what you'll see here is a uh, control bar or a, um, essentially a cutoff value that it's calculating for you uh, across which if there are any points beyond that you may have to uh, really look into them further to make sure that they're not um, something particularly going wrong with either your measuring system or maybe even that those points are just simply extreme. And with the Mahalanobis distances uh, calculation here, we see that really none of the points are, um, first off, across this, this control line, 
uh, nor are there any points that are, are really, really far from the center cloud. Uh, it seems like uh, these are pretty evenly distributed across the, uh, the distance measure here. There are some extreme points, um, but there's no one point that is uh, extremely extreme. That is, uh, we don't have a distance of 10 or 12 for any one point. Uh, what we have instead are points that uh, range across the uh, really 0 to, to 3 range here. And we have some that, that almost cross the boundary. Um, but we have a few really at that edge. We don't have any single that's really uh, extremely far. Um, now, jackknife distances is, as I said earlier, uh, the Mahalanobis distance. but the distance of each point to the centroid that's calculated without that point included. Uh, now the reason you might want to use this uh, as, an, as another metric for multivariate distance uh, is because this actually doesn't allow the point to drag the centroid towards it. And this is a situation where when you have very, very extreme points, and especially a couple extreme points, uh, collectively their extremity or their extremeness can drag the centroid so far towards them that it can also hide the outlying nature of other points. So by excluding the points when calculating the centroid, it allows you to detect outliers uh, in a little bit different in a little bit different of a way. And um, occasionally when you have very far extreme points, this is going to be the, uh, the better um, metric to use. Now in this case, we do have those three points, the three that were close to the line up here, crossing the boundary. Uh, but again, in this case, we don't have um, really a huge gap between these three points and the rest of the data. Uh, that is, they do cross the boundary, but we don't really have in this case, any reason to think that, that they're really uh, of a different process. That is, they're not so far and away beyond the other points as far as multivariate distance uh, that we really need to be too concerned of them. Uh, so based on these uh, really metrics that we have so far, uh, we don't see any points that are extreme, at least with respect to our predictor space. That is, we don't have any points that would lead us to be concerned that uh, we had a process failure or a measurement failure. Um, now given this, we can uh, go forth and actually look to see if we have any points um, that have an undue influence on the regression relationship. Uh, but already we've seen that we don't really have points that are very extreme in uh, the X space, so much so that we would be concerned. So what we're probably going to end up finding, given that we haven't found anything very um, strange in this section, is that we're probably not going to have very many problems with influence. Uh, but it's still an important thing to check because you don't want any particular point really having a lot of influence on the regression relationship. And if you do find that, uh, you should really run the analysis with and without it uh, to make sure, at least for yourself, uh, that your relationship is going to uh, replicate in future studies. So we're going to close this multivariate section. And what we're going to do is, if you still have your analysis open, uh, go to that, so your fit least squares. Uh, if you don't already have that open, go ahead and rerun the analysis uh, using age, severity, and um, anxiety as your predictors, and satisfaction as your y. Now the measure of influence we're going to look at here is Cook's D. Cook's D is produced by default in JMP, uh, so it's going to be an easy uh, measure for you to produce, uh, but it's also one that's fairly informative. Now what Cook's D is measuring is the collective influence of an individual uh, on the fitted values of everybody else. Uh, so what Cook's D is really uh, computationally doing uh, is looking at how everyone else's fitted score is affected by removing one individual's score from the model. Uh, so if your Cook's D uh, is very large, what that means is that uh, a model that includes you and one that does not uh, produces fitted values for everybody else that differ quite a bit. And so if you think about this, uh, you would not want a single individual in your data set to have a very large Cook's D, because what that would indicate is that uh, their particular score is influencing or changing everybody else's fitted score quite a bit. Uh, to produce Cook's D, it's actually fairly straightforward. We go to the drop-down, go to Save Columns, and select Cook's D, Influence. And what this is going to do, once we minimize this set, is produce for us a new column that for every individual in your data set uh, has their collective or their combined Cook's D. 
that is the amount of influence or effect they exert on everybody else's fitted score. Uh, now the easiest way to visualize this is again going to analyze distribution and simply putting the Cook's D influence into the Y's and getting a histogram for your Cook's D. Uh, and now what you can see is that we have um, of course some Cook's D's that are larger and they fall off in influence quite a bit. Uh, but we don't have any single Cook's D that is really extreme and separated uh, from the bulk of the rest of the data. Um, now one rule of thumb for Cook's D, although with most of these things, uh, these rules of thumbs, who knows where they really come from, uh, but one rule of thumb is that a Cook's D that's above uh, the number of scores in your data, or sorry, four divided by the number of scores in your data set uh, should be considered large. Uh, so in this case, if we have 46 individuals, we can take 4 divided by 46, and you see that a Cook's D above about 0.08 should be considered large. Uh, now for us, notice that our Cook's D, the largest in our data set, uh, is 0.10. We can find it under the maximum. Uh, so we're really not coming anywhere near that point. Uh, another rule says that Cook's D's above about 1 uh, should be considered large. And notice again that we're nowhere near that, uh, that cutoff. Uh, so in this case, we don't have any single point that really appears to be exerting a great deal of influence on our regression relationships, that is, on the fitted values for every other individual. Uh, and this is exactly what we would like to find. Uh, we don't want to be in a situation where a single point uh, is really exerting a huge amount of influence on our regression.